Okay, so we left last time with exiting. Uh, I'm going to do a quick recap uh, and jump into where we left. So basically most functions were exiting either by returning a value of success or throwing an error failure. And we were going to cover like types of return values, implicit versus explicit, visible versus invisible errors. And we stopped kind of at exit handlers. Um, so implicit versus explicit, we had this example and basically an implicit return is when the last expression is evaluated uh, and returns that last value that was evaluated. You can return explicitly by calling return uh, like here. And then about invisible and visible types of return, we said that uh, most functions return visibly. So when you call the function in an inter interactive environment like here, uh, it will print the result, the one that the function had. But sometimes, yeah, well, you can prevent the automatic printing by applying an invisible to that last value. So here, for instance, when we type J4, uh, nothing gets printed because we wrap the one in between invisible. But you can verify that the value exists. And for that, you can do three things. Uh, print J4, you can wrap it in parentheses, or you could use uh, with visible. And it will also give you a flag, not only the value here, the one, but a value of whether it's visible or not, and it's false. And the most common example of a function that is returning invisibly is the assignment. So for instance, when you assign uh, a two uh, here, uh, if I wrap it between parentheses, I can actually check that actually there is something assigned there. And this is what makes, makes it possible to chain assignments. So the two gets pointed to D, that gets to C and B, et cetera. And well, in general, uh, basically uh, any function that is uh, primarily called for a side effect, like assign something or print or plot, should we return an invisible value? And then about errors, basically the chapter says that if a function cannot complete its assigned task, it should throw an error with stop and this should terminate the execution of the function immediately. So for instance, here, when we put the stop, the function terminates with, the, with error. And an interesting thing is that basically, I mean, there are some languages that rely on special return values to indicate problems, uh, but in R you should always put it explicitly a stop. And then here is basically where we left, exit handlers. Uh, well, an exit handler is uh, run regardless of whether the function exits normally or with an error, it will always run. So if you want to be sure that the global state is restored, no matter how the function exits, you can use on exit. And this is the example that we saw that is basically printing this on exit and gets the goodbye that will always be printed uh, if the, whether the function returns or not with an error. So for instance, when we call J6 with a true, it will get into here and give me a 10 and J6 false, it will get into here and give me the error. So in both cases, actually I'm getting still the goodbye printed regardless of whether there is the error or the return of 10. And an interesting thing is that if you don't do this add true option, uh, each call to an exit will overwrite the previous exit handler. And now he gives an example with two exit handlers. So I mean, here we only have one, but <clears throat> in the next one we have two, uh, which is an example of how on exit is useful. Uh, basically, it, it one, one usefulness is that it allows you to place cleanup code directly to the code that requires cleanup. Uh, and I remember I struggled a little bit with this example, and I think I wrote here what I learned uh, from the function. Uh, so here we are going to uh, set the working directory, and we also have uh, some options, right? But we are using on exit to, to restore the state. So an interesting thing when I check the help of set work directory is that it will return invisibly the current directory before changing it. So actually this first line is, uh, is actually both storing the, the, the current or all work, working directory here before setting it to, to there. Uh, and then on exit, it will reset back to what was stored in all, in all there when exiting. And the same goes for the options. Uh, 
And this coupled with Swayze evaluation, which I recall it basically as uh, things get, uh, get accessed uh, only when evaluated. Uh, this creates a power, a useful pattern for running code in an altered environment. So for instance, now we have exactly the same example of a setting work directory and, and, and resetting it back. And we are also doing force code. Uh, the comment there is that actually, I mean, in the book, it said that force is unnecessary, but it makes it clear that we are enforcing the code run. Uh, and this is basically a function that will allow us to run our code uh, within a, a specific directory. So when we when we check what is the working directory at the moment, is is that one? And then when we call this function, actually, uh, then uh, at, when exiting, the the function will restore the old working directory, which is home. And an interesting thing that I found about this function, it said, I think in the book there, that, uh, that the, the nice thing about doing this instead of sourcing is that you can actually, let's say, control, have full control of the directory because when you do source, uh, you pass parse the file, but if you want to, to change the, the directory, you have to use uh, chdir, which specifies if the working directory should be changed or not. So, you specify if change or not, but not exactly in which directory to run your code. Uh, and, uh, then about the order, it says that in R3, 4, and earlier, on exits are always, or earlier or later. Now I'm doubting myself. Uh, I will check this before uh, uh, doing the pull request. Uh, expressions are always run in the, uh, in the order of creation. So here we have this J8 function that is printing two messages, A and B, and it's running in the order that they were created. Uh, yeah, now here it says, okay, if you need a specific order in R3.5 and later, you can control it with after F. Small. Forms, I'm trying not to take that much of your time, Rebecca, with environments, let's see. Um, so basically here in this section, it, co it covers different varieties of calls. Uh, so we have four, uh, prefix, infix, replacement, and special. Uh, prefix is when the name comes before the arguments, like here. Infix is when the name of the function comes between the arguments. And replacement are the, the ones that are replacing values by assignment. So like replacing the values of the names in the app with this assignment, C, uh, A, B, C, the, the vector. Uh, so uh, and a special are functions like these square brackets if and for, and they don't have a consistent structure. And an interesting thing is that while we do have these four forms, uh, actually you only need one because everything can be written in prefix form. Uh, so the example about how to rewrite in prefix that is given there is that, for instance, below we have three pairs of equivalent calls, rewriting an infix form, a replacement form, and a special form into prefix form. So this is the infix with a name in between, and I put you can put the name at the beginning uh, as a as as prefix comes before the arguments. You can do the same with uh, with with uh, with this one with replacement, uh, where actually the name of the function will be wrapped here between this the the brackets. Apparently, you can do this. This is the equivalent. I didn't know, <laughs> and you can also do this with a with a for. And so, I mean, a useful application for when will you be trying to write in, in, in this way is when you're using a functional programming tools. So for instance, when you want to add uh, numbers uh, and let's say you have a list, you can actually use the function add uh, like this. And you will be adding three to each list item that you have uh, there with y uh, set to three. Uh, but you can also get the same result by relying on the plus function. So you can put a plus. Um, prefix is the most common in R and many other languages. And it's a bit of special calls in R because you can specify arguments in three, in three ways. You can go by position, uh, by name, or you can use partial matching. Uh, and now we're going to go through the examples. Uh, so match by position, unique prefixes, and exact name. So here we have this function uh, that is uh, doing this list. 
And how was this? So for instance, here now it's calling just one, two, three. So it's going by position and it's putting the, the, the one where the first argument goes and it's reporting the two uh, as this and the three. And if not, I mean, when you actually, then I think this one is, uh, well, this is kind of like, this is like, ma ma well, it's not partial matching because this is saying unique prefix. I think, no, this is exact name, exact name, right? I'm giving the exact name and I'm saying the first argument should be a one. So the first argument will be a one and it's named A. And it's this one, the one that has name A is the one. And then we have two and three and they are placed there by precision afterwards. And you can do, you can abrogate, abrogate long argument names. Uh, I think this is kind of like partial matching. I mean, you, you just call it A maybe, and it identifies that is the first argument here. So it should go here and it's the item with a name A, it's this one, and then you get two, three. And, but for instance, this type of call here uh, at the end, it won't work because we, the abbreviation is ambiguous. Uh, I think I have two names starting with B. Yeah, two, two arguments, two argument names that start with B. So yes, the, uh, the error here. Yeah, argument three matches multiple formal arguments. And the recommendation is uh, you use only positional matching for the first two or one or two arguments, the ones that are commonly used and that readers know what they are, but you avoid it for less commonly used arguments and you try to never use partial matching. Uh, so infix uh, functions. Uh, you can define, for instance, your own infix function. You can create two arguments uh, and bind them uh, into a name uh, that starts and ends with uh, the, the, sim the symbol, percentage. Uh, so for instance, this is the name of the function, is that one. And the function is doing, is taking A, B arguments and is pasting them. So here is the call. You parse uh, this string and this other string, and we are going to apply our function and it returns new string. And these examples are also similar. Uh, but so for instance, I mean, you have to be careful with some characters that you might need to escape, uh, but there is no need to escape when calling it, but yes, when defining it. And yeah, an interesting thing about these functions is that R's default precedence rules means that infix operators are composed left to right. So there is here an example with paste and uh, the, the first two items, and now we are going to do A and B, that out, so that output gives us this. And when I do the output with C, it will do this. And if I, let's say, build the, the, the anything in the book, it was just this line. And I added the, the two intermediate ones to check out how it was building. So it got left from right first. Um, replacement. Uh, replacement functions I act like they modify their arguments in place and have a special name. Um, and actually, uh, the book says act like because they actually create a, modi a modified copy. And you can check this with trace mem. I think we covered this in chapters two or three, something like that. So these functions, they require they have to have arguments named x and value, and they must return a modified object. So for instance, we have uh, this function that modifies the second element of a vector. Um, uh, and when you call them, uh, so replacement functions are used by placing the function call on the left side of the assignment. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm calling this function. Yes. Okay. With x, and x is just the sequence 1 to 10, and the sec it will change the second value. Okay. That one, it put an integer five. Uh, additional arguments, if your replacement function needs those, uh, you can place them between the X and the value. So like here, and you can call the replacement function with additional arguments. And this is an analogous example, basically. It's modifying the first value. And then we have the special ones, which are a bunch of features that are usually written in special ways, but also have prefix forms. And basically this includes uh, the tools of control flow. Uh, I think that was the previous chapter to this one, maybe five weeks ago now. Uh, and yeah, 
So basically, you just, I mean, when you're writing if condition true, you can actually write it in prefix uh, by using the back, back ticks. I couldn't remember the word for these back ticks, I think, right? Thank you. <laughs> and yeah, you can include a, a parentheses. So you can do it this and subset in the same. Um, yes. I think this was interesting. So uh, for instance, knowing the name of the function that underlies the special form is useful for getting the documentation. So when you try to get the help on parentheses, it's a syntax error. But when you do, uh, when you, you wrap it in back ticks, it will give you the documentation for parentheses. Uh, yeah, basically all these special forms are implemented as primitive C functions. So printing them is usually not uh, informative. I guess, yeah, the brackets and we said something else. And I think that's it. That covered the whole chapter. Thank you. That was great. I I learned a lot from this chapter that, um, yeah, like I had no idea you could call um, the, the prefix and the functions. Sorry, you could call, um, oh gosh, I already forgot to get names now. What were they called? <laughs> Like you can call plus. Yeah, you can write everything in practice. Yeah. Uh, so I thought the I thought the apply l apply example was great. You know, yeah. like I would have known that you could do that. Yeah, yeah. There were some weird ones. Like I have never done this in my life. I think, but it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I thought the yeah that l apply one. I thought was like okay, I could totally see using uh, that. Yeah, this one, the plus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Typically, I think yeah, this is more common, right? You define a function to apply to each element of the the loop. Yeah. Cool. Any other comments or should I stop sharing and we move to environments? We're good, right? I will stop sharing. All right. Thanks for doing that. Um, Thanks. Okay. All right. Um, so environments. I can't believe this is only in chapter seven because I started to find it a bit confusing. Um, so the point of this chapter, um, what we want to learn is the structure and functionality of environments, the key differences between environments and lists, and the significance of parent environments and how they relate to scoping rules. Um, all right. So the environment is the structure that powers scoping. And um, yeah, so this this chapter is going to talk about the the structure of of scoping. So lexical scoping. Now it's been like six weeks since we covered that or something. I don't know. Um, but this is how a function um, yeah find uh, looks up the values of names. So this was the sentence that I remember we uh, sounded a bit odd at the time, but it's a term that tells us that. Scoping rules use a parse time rather than a runtime structure. So what that means is that where a function is going to look for values is um, determined not when it's run, but when it's parsed. <laughs> um, so yeah, when it's parsed into, into R. So um, the example they use here is we have x is a as a global variable we've assigned to the it's binding five. Um, we're creating a func I'm sorry, a function adder, create adder that returns a function. Um, and create adder 10. So uh, this function um, returns a function of x plus 10 plus z. And then Um, when you call adder 20. So you have this function that uh, is adding, wait, how does this know what z is? Oh, sorry, it returns a function z. There we go. So uh, result is a function um, x plus 10 plus 20, um, and x is 5 here. So uh, yeah. So it returns 35. Yeah, so this is lexical scoping is what's used in R. And that's the, when R is parsed, R remembers where each variable is defined. 
And uh, so the environment where the function is defined is crucial, but dynamic scoping is common in other languages and there the variables, the function might look for the, may, uh, looks for the variables based on where the function is called. All right, so the things covered in this chapter are basics of environments. Um, yeah, it seems reasonable and straightforward recursing with environments. So um, environments really um, lend themselves to, to some recursion problems. There are a few important special environments, um, packages, functions, namespace, and execution environments, and then uh, call stack and applications. So, Environments are basically named lists, but they have a couple of exceptions. Um, so names must be unique, uh, not true in a list. Names are unordered. This is a handy feature of environments. Um, every, an environment has a parent um, and modifications occur in place. So copying, there's no copying of an environment when you modify something. So um, there are some, they, they use the Arlang package throughout here. Arlang has a lot of env um, functions that are useful. So you can create a new list um, with Arlang env, or then they also give the base functionality throughout, but I'll just kind of focus on the Arlang. Um, so it looks basically like a named list. You've got env as your, um, as your function, and now you've created some bindings and um, all right, so environments bind names to values. So, uh, oops, so this is an environment. This is how he's drawing um, an environment with the, um, wait, what did the blue dot mean? The blue dot means it has a parent, right? Uh, blue, sorry. I think so, yeah. Yeah, so the parent is, yeah. Okay, so yeah, this was three weeks ago. Um, so yeah, they're not ordered and names can also um, reference another environment. So um, here we that we just created this environment. It's an environment that has a parent environment somewhere, not explicitly listed here, but it's otherwise it kind of looks a lot like a like a list. Um, so, but interestingly, they can also also include other environments. So um, an environment can um, contain its own self. So you can bind D to E1. E1 is our environment that we created. Do, 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 E1. Um, and so there's recursion going on right here. Um, so just a bunch of just little different functions for working with and learning about the environment you're in. You can just print your environment and that gives you the memory address, not often super helpful, but you know, now you know what that thing is, <laughs> um, just the memory address. So if you print it, you learn a little bit more about it. So you learn both the memory address, what its parent environment is, and then the bindings within it. Um, you can also name, um, get the names of the bindings within env names. Um, and then there are a couple of very important environments so we've got the current environment, and that's where um, code execution is happening. And you've got the global environment, which is where interactive computations occur. So you know, most things when you're in an interactive session are in your global environment. Um, and uh, you have to use the identical uh, um, function to compare two environments to see if they're the same thing. Um, because this assumes vectorization, which you don't have in environments. So every environment has a parent, um, except the empty environment. And this is really important for lexical scoping. So uh, where functions go to um, find, uh, find things, names. So you can set the parent environment um, just by passing an unnamed argument when you're creating an environment. Um, otherwise, the default is the current environment. So here we have E2A and, um, wait, E2A, sorry. <laughs> we have E2A, which is going to be the parent of E2B. 
Um, and so E2, B's, his parent is uh, represented by the blue arrow. So we can find the single parent of an environment with environment parent. And then if you want more, you can use parents and then you can see all of them. Um, oh, whoops. Um, yeah, so empty environment is where things end and that's the only environment without a parent. So here they're explicitly setting it as the parent of this one. Um, and it is the ancestor of all environments in general. Um, so you can see all ancestors with environment parents, but it stops at the global um, environment by default, because often you have a bunch more environments here. Um, all your packages are gonna be below this. So it stops by default at, at global. If you want it to go all the way to the end um, with empty environment, you can specify that. There's a last argument. You can specify whatever you want, but um, yeah. So super assignment. Um, regular assignment, you create a bind, you um, create a variable in the current environment. When you super assign, you modify, and it, it was interesting when they use this in the book, they kept saying modify an existing variable found in the environment or create if it, if it doesn't exist. So I'm not sure why they, um, I felt like that was emphasized in some reason that it modifies unless it exists. But um, so this is often like something you generally don't want. <laughs> um, but you it, it, uh, function factors are coming down in a couple chapters. So um, I think we'll find out when this is going to be potentially useful. I've only known about this being danger, danger, bad practice. So I'm glad to learn about um, when it's useful. But here, um, you know, in the global environment, we've have x a zero, we have this function that normally when you, normally this runs in its own environment and something that gets um, created here does not affect the value in the global environment, but if you super assign it, that changes. And so if you call f and then um, we look at the value of x, it's actually is actually one. So um, getting and setting environments. So not entirely like lists, but similar to lists. Um, you can uh, access them with the um, dollar sign <laughs> and double brackets. So, um, but you're, you know, you're double, so you can access it with a dollar sign. You can get this X, um, you can access it with uh, named in the double brackets. Um, you can't do named and you can't do double brackets in a number here because unlike lists, they are not ordered. Um, environment bind, you can bind multiple values. Um, you can uh, bind multiple values together. So we've said that we've already created this environment. We're adding some more things to it. Um, and the bindings and environment names are these five things now I've created two here and added three more in different ways. Um, so if you set it to null, like that's how you can remove things sometimes in lists, right? But you can't do that in environments because environments can have values of null, um, bindings here of null. So you have to use environment unbind when you want to remove something from a from an environment. Um, and there are just two helper functions, unbind and has. So when we unbind it, environment has no longer contains A. The environment E3 no longer contains A. Um, so uh, yeah, they have a couple of other functions that uh, do something similar, but have just a little variety in terms of how they handle errors and default, default values. And um, one common is that when you unbind things, um, the binding is lost from that environment and garbage collection um, actually deletes the objects because it deletes things that are not bound. Okay, so recursing over environments. Um, so you might want to look over every ancestor of an environment. And so this section um, goes through writing a function that takes a name and finds where the name is defined. Um, and it just takes the, uh, so it takes the environment where to start looking and what you're looking for. And so you have three cases, either um, it's 
sorry, I'm confused for a second here. <laughs> if it's, if it, oh, sorry. If you're in the envir empty environment, um, then you, there's nothing there. And so you absolutely can't find this name. So you return, um, just can't find it. Um, other option is that you're in an environment that does have this name um, and great, you return the name of that environment. And um, otherwise you get to recurse. So not something that I'm used to writing in R, a recursive function, um, where you're calling where, and um, you started with the caller environment and now you're looking up one level, you're looking at the parent of the caller environment. So um, yeah, either you can call it and we don't have YYY anywhere in this environment, in, um, in this chain of environments, so I can't find it. Um, X exists in this current environment and mean doesn't exist in the um, global environment, but it doesn't it, uh, exist in base. So it went up to base and found mean. All right, this is where I feel like things got started getting really a little spicier. Um, so there are four, but uh, four, three, it looks like, um, special environments at the cover, package, function, environment, function, and execution. Um, and, and caller, I guess. Um, okay, so package, package and function environments interact to support namespaces, which ensure that a package always behaves the same way, regardless of what other packages the user has loaded. So super important. So as you attach packages, each package becomes one of the parents of the global environment. Um, and as you attach a new package, it is the parent of the global environment. Um, and so the, uh, and then, yeah, so, this is the package you attach first. This is the package you attach most recently. Um, so here we get in some fun. We're talking about the function environment. So a function binds the current environment when it is created. This is where closures come from. So this is used for, this is called the function environment and it's used for lexical scoping. Um, so this is called a closure um, and it's sometimes used interchangeably with function in R. So the function environment has a nice handy R lang function, function environment. So you can um, see what environment the, this function binds. And so here it's the global environment. We just defined, we defined this in the global environment, the function environment, the, the function F binds the global environment. And so this is represented here. So F, we look for F in the global environment. Um, F looks for X within its function definition. Um, and the parent of this, nope, never mind. I'm not going to say that. I'm not totally sure. Now I'm confused about exactly what this represents. Do, do either of you know? Now I get confused about what black. Okay. So, yeah, this, um, correct me if I'm wrong. So what this is saying, and I think I delete, yeah, I shouldn't have deleted that from the notes. This is important. All right, so this is saying that um, Uh, if there, if f is going to call some, is, if f is going to refer to a variable that's not defined within f, um, they'll it'll look in that global environment. So um, f binds the environment that binds the name f to the function. So we look for f in the global environment, and f enclosed the global environment. Um, so that is not always what happens. One, what, what, uh, where, where, where is it? So, one, y is equal to yeah. one. Okay. So and that's one mm -hmm. is not in the global environment. No, that's this is what, what, uh, uh, this is how all of the, um, so y binds one. So, y is in the global environment. The binding is never, um, of, of the values are always shown as outside the, um, 
environment. So like all of these, sorry, like the binding happens outside of it. Um, the, sorry, the value that it's bound to is not shown as within the environment. The name is the only thing that's really in the environment. Okay, but they are inside. Mm, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, okay. So, okay, so here, so like this function, why, um, yeah, f, if you run this function, um, it will find this y value in the global environment. That's where it will look for y since it's not, um, it's not defined anywhere else. It, it's not defined within um, f itself. So, oh, shucks, sorry. Um, that was, okay. Um, sorry about that, did not mean to break that much. Okay, so, you but you can get into situations where it's not this, it, it, it's different from this. So here we create an environment E, that's what this is. Um, and we create a function G within this environment. So this is our global environment where we're used to interacting, right? But we said that we're actually creating this function G within um, this other environment. G is still, um, binding the global environment. So I feel like I should just do this in R real quick. Um, but so G looks for its values in here and which will also look in the global environment, but we can't access G without going into environment E. So um, this was confusing to me. So, um, which is why I deleted it from the notes. So we have, I think it makes more sense to have the function um, I did not need to do that. Um, have b function x plus y. Um, and let's assign y as one as it has in that. So y and one is in the global environment, right? So, oh, I mean, sorry, we need that to be function x. Okay. So, and Y exists in the global environment, that's the only thing in the global environment. So um, if we call G of three, that this is gonna fail, it doesn't know about G, right? Um, so we can call E G of three and it'll find four. So even though G is not in our global environment, um, G finds Y in our global environment based on how this is defined. Um, Okay, sorry, so yeah. All right, namespaces. So the goal of a namespace is to make sure that how you order package does not impact how packages find functions. So they give the example of standard deviation. So standard deviation um, uses uh, this function var um, and um, yeah, well, you wanna make sure that if another package is defined var, that that nothing that this always returns the same value. So every function in a package is actually associated with two different environments. One is the package environment, and one is the namespace environment. And um, the namespace, the, so the package environment is what we generally interact with as a user. Um, that's all the external facing functions. So all the things that um, you can call with just two colons. The namespace environment is the internal interface of the package. And the namespace environment includes all of um, the bindings in the package environment. And it also includes the um, internal non-exported stuff. So um, the, the, yeah, so the st standard deviation is looking for um, the, variance function. It starts with the um, stats namespace environment and not the package environment. And these will have different parents that becomes clear how it's useful. Okay, yeah. So, so when a standard deviation is looking for the value of var, of var, it finds it in a sequence of environments that is 
specified by the package developer, not the package user. So the, um, yeah, the parent environment of this, um, you know, it, it, it better, it better find var before it gets to base. Um, and this is the only reason that, um, it go, it then goes on to global environment as the parent of bases for some edge case reasons, but uh, about R6, I think. Um, but yeah, so the, the parents of namespace and the, um, yeah, are actually, they're actually, these are like two different trees that happen of the namespace parents versus the package parents. Um, so the code always works the same way, regardless of what other packages have been attached. All right, so um, here we get to execution environments. Um, so you create a function G and if the environment, um, if the not, if A is not in a uh, binding in the current environment, then you define A and you create it. Otherwise, um, a is assigned A plus one and you return A. So um, if we call G of 10, um, we get, it returns defining one and it shows us one. Now, do you think that this, do you think you get the same result? Do you think you get one or two if we call G of 10 again? And the answer is you get one because um, this principle called the fresh start principle. So each time a function is called, a new environment is called to host the execution. Um, so there's an execution environment, which um, has a parent that's the function environment. So execution environments are short-lived, they're garbage collected in general, um, although you can manipulate that if you want. You can actually explicitly return an execution environment and you can do some things implicitly that force the return of it. Um, yeah, in general, these are all like clean slate things. Okay, so then we have call stacks. Um, there are just some definitions here. I, so the caller environment is the environment from which the function was called. And a call stack is made up of frames and executing a function creates an execution environment as well as the call stacks. So here you have a function f that um, calls uh, G and calling H. So um, if you what is this? Why am I confused by the X here? Oh, okay. All right. Um, so yeah, if you um, you get to H, it stops, and um, the error you'll generally see by traceback, and it goes from most recent to the first thing. Um, they prefer using the lobster package, the call stack tree, because it it goes the other direction. Um, sorry, this is a weird mouse. Um, so if instead of uh, getting looking at the traceback, you, you return the call stack tree, um, you see things in the order of which they happen, not whereas the first thing happened, the second thing happened, the third thing happened. Um, call, st call stack tree was called from H, which was called from G, which was called from F. So they think it's easier to think it, look at it this way when things get more complicated. Um, and these trees don't always uh, look like this because of lazy evaluation. So they can have multiple branches. Um, so when arguments are eagerly evaluated, then it'll just be that one branch. But we have some lazy evaluation because um, uh, X is just getting passed along. Um, they're just passing along an argument and we don't need to evaluate X until we get to, to C. Um, then we have end up with two different branches. So in the first branch, we have the um, F 
uh, A calling B calling C. And C evaluates X, um, which was the function F. So now we have a second branch that's going to reflect that. So F calling G calling H. Um, and the these reflect different environments, actually. So that's why they're not all on the same same tree. Okay, so a frame is the element that makes up a call stack, and that's the evaluation context. Um, this is important. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm not sure if we learn more about this later. Uh, yeah, because I don't really understand those details. Um, okay, but I can read it. <laughs> um, so a frame has three components, the expression, giving the function call, um, an environment. So we've got, all right, so right, these are each of the frames, okay, on, on a stack. Um, so we've got an expression, the environment, um, which is generally the execution environment, and um, the parent. So yeah, that's that's a that's a frame. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, some some variable, some languages use dynamic scoping stuff, right? Um, and they actually that will be talked about somewhere farther, farther down this this very long book. Um, okay, so they're also saying you can work with environments as data structures because they have a couple of properties that might make that nice for you. Um, yeah, I'll be interested. So for one thing, right, um, environments don't copy. Um, that the reference semantics means that it doesn't it doesn't create copies right we talked about that at the beginning um it modifies in place so um you can also manage state um across function calls um which yeah okay and then as a hash map so this is it takes yeah this is one of the the properties um of environments is that it takes a constant time um, to find an object based on its name and environments have that behavior. So there are apparently some usages that make use of, there's some, um, yeah, I don't know, some packages that make use of this property. Um, yeah, so there are five questions that were at the beginning of the chapter that I thought were helpful to revisit. Um, so three ways that an environment differs from a list. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to say, but they um, they have to be named, they don't have order, they have parents, and they have this reference semantics. Um, parent of a global environment is the, yeah, the last package you loaded, and the empty environment is the only one without any parents. Um, the enclosing environment of the function, this one, uh, yeah, this is, oh, I want to read it to make sure I don't mess up. Yeah, it's where it's what's created and that determines, right? So when it's, when a function is created, it encloses the environment and that determines how a function looks for its variables. Um, you can use the function environment, oh, no, call our environment, right? Yeah, call our environment. <laughs> to look at where a function was called, and then uh, this assigns things in the global environment versus this is what you almost always want, but apparently there's some cases where this is a cool feature, and we will learn about those. Yeah, current environment versus, um, oh, parent of current environment. Okay. Yeah, anyway, environments, um, yeah, good to know about. I've gotten into some problems sometime when I accidentally had some environments um, coming around with some work because of, uh, sorry, like when you have, so they talk about function factories, right? Where you might want to, um, I don't know, 
but functions involved um, evaluate in other functions is where the environments can get messy if you're not careful and yeah it, so that actually goes mostly with the when you're returning um like when you might return the execution environment um yeah so thank you thank you so i finally understood the, this good assignment uh which is which was like a bit of uh, uh not very clear to me so now i understood uh so if you put it inside a function you basically make sure that if there is any other values with the same name in the environment you will rename it to the one the, to a value that you want to be renamed to so this is uh, very important one question, if you uh, that is not uh, actually clear to me, is that are these other environments? Okay, we have we've got the global environment. Yeah. Okay, so in two R, so you you can see the environment, and there are the variables that you uh, name uh, or functions, um, data sets, uh, variables that you name along the way. What you um, cool. What happens when you create a new environment? So, where where this new environment? Where is it located? Where is it? So it's still inside the global environment, but you cannot access uh, have access to it. Um, where no, is it? So right. So you're saying like when I create an environment here? Yeah. Let's say. So did you did you did you create a, a new environment there because I didn't yeah so e and e is just a new environment so we can see that this environment is in my global environment okay yeah so when I'm working here so let's if um we want to assign e some things we're gonna give it a oh wait. okay so e uh, uh env uh, function creates a new environment. So I assign env to e, for example, and so I create a new environment. Oops. But what, yeah. Where did our go? Okay. Yeah, so we'll just do this. So here's our e1. So we have this e1. Okay. We have it, it is in the global, yeah. So e1 is within the global environment. Um, we don't have, like when we're looking over here at our global environment, we can't access C or anything. Like I can't use that. Okay. Uh, C, right, is a primitive function for like concatenating stuff, right? But I can't find D, right? I can access this just like, I can access D within this environment, just like you would a list. Okay. So it has the environment parent of E1 is the global environment. So when you're looking at, like this uh, stack of environments. Where did that exist? Recursing? No. Whoa. Okay. Let's go just to the book. Come on, Hadley. Um, a couple of more pictures, right? Yeah. So our environment E1 just like exists right here. And then its parent is a global environment. And then the parent of that is. Arling, because that was the last package I attached. Okay, so if I use Arlang search environment, amps, search amps, I can see. Can you do that? Um, what do you want to see? Sorry. Arlang uh, search amps. Oh, sorry. Um, Arlang, oh, search in. Okay, yeah. So you want to look for D? Hmm. Whoops. Actually, what is search in? Oh, maybe it's not. Uh, uh, the... Oh, search in. Um, yeah, you want oh. maybe? Right. That's just the. Sorry. That's just. I. 
yeah search engine just gives the the so this is gonna my all right if we look it's my guess is that oh wow um is that it's gonna give us this option of where to start um Is not uh, E is not there uh, any anywhere there. Yeah. So the name of the environment attached to search path. Um, so the chain always starts with the global environment. So um, hmm, I wonder if you can. Not even the global environment is, uh, you know. That the it, it shows what's inside the search and well you can do environment names um environment global and you can see that we have okay. one and e within it um but this by default starts at the global environment which is the parent of e1 so i don't know how we would um i don't know how we could force it to start at e1 um so they are not actually environment so they are sub environment no it's an environment it's just by default starting at the global for this one it's a it is an environment it's just the one that you're going to be working with interactively as is going to be as long as you're in an interactive section is the global environment. But this is a totally valid valid. Why? Is that an environment? I find it interesting why it's an environment. No, these are not names of environment. These are the names of all of the bindings within ah. this the bindings of the environment yeah yeah um yeah good point so i still keep reading the assignment uh, arrow in the other direction i still i mean in my mind i i mean i do remember chapter two bindings and values but i still read the it's hard yeah it's in the other direction then it would make yeah <laughs> yeah and the thing about environments for me is that like I think on some high level or, or some broad understanding, it's like, okay, this makes sense. But I feel like the problem is you can, is in the details of the like function and calling environment and stuff and maintaining that level of understanding. Um, yeah, that, you know, this is not how you're most, you're not gonna be just doing this for fun most of the time. It's gonna be like, oh, is your function finding the right thing at the right time? Are you? Yeah, I think it's a bit abstract, let's say, and flexible. So the combination of those two things plus all the rules within that functions work, functions within environments. And yeah, it's a little bit tricky, I think. Yeah. And it's not every day's life maybe also. No. Not, not, not mine, for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel like you need it when you run into some weird errors and whether or not you know that it's related. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, it is present in everyday life. It's just not in everyday life I am creating environments, but you typically can run into some problems when you're calling a function and it lives in one place. And yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're definitely making use of like the fresh start thing all the time. They're definitely properties of environments that we're working with all the time, but um, yeah, not in, in an abstract or a hands off way. Yeah. Yeah, no, I didn't know also that packages and namespaces have environments for things. I think I didn't yeah. read that part of the chapter yet. So this was super useful. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, so yeah, they, I mean, they they overlap, right? So we get namespaces start going to package environments. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I, I had no understanding of how, how this um, property was was preserved. How the fact that you don't need to, yeah. So, all right. Um, That's up with my reading of that, but uh, thanks a lot. I mean, it was super useful. Yeah.